Here at the Command Valley Podcast, we were inspired to make EDH content that was a little bit more different and unique than you've usually seen. You're watching one of 12 Elder Dragon Highlander games consisting of four of the same players. However, there's a twist. The goal of the season is to attain as many points as you can. Points are awarded by wins, plays, and other interesting challenges. The player at the end of the season with the most points wins. Welcome to Duel of the Peaks. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 5 of Duels of the Peaks. We're super excited that you guys are here. We have a super fun lineup for you guys today. All of the decks that we are playing are themed around a commander from Ikoria, whether it be from the commander product or the main set. All of these decks were built by us individually and if you want to see any of these decks, you can go ahead and check out the deck techs in our channel. We will post the links in our show notes below. Before we begin, I wanted to remind you guys to please subscribe. We're getting so close to a thousand subscribers, so please help us hit that milestone. We really appreciate it and we thank everybody who supported us up to this point and hope you join in on the bandwagon. Another reminder that this episode and this podcast is brought to you by GameGrid Lehigh. If you are in the Utah County area, please check them out. They have an amazing staff, awesome card selection, tons of deck boxes, deck sleeves, and tons of other board games and board game accessories. So big shout outs to them and we hope you check them out. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different. We have uh, me, Griffin, here, who's going to be doing the side-by-side -side commentary. And Lannon, I'll be doing the play-by-play -play calling. Oh, we have Cutaway Spotlight, four cards that are going to be important in this game, and Peter will be able to take care of those, so you'll have a little bit of all three of us during this episode. And without further ado, let's begin. Landon here. I'm going to be going over the, the decks, the opening hands, and the challenges. So, like always, the three-point challenge for this game is to win. So if you win the game, you earn three points. And then you get three points if you cast your commander exactly once during the game. You get those points upon cast, and then you lose those points if you cast your commander again throughout the game. You then get two points if you cast two spells of each color in your commander's color identity. And if you cast a multicolored spell, you have to pick a color, and you cannot use your commander as part of this. For example, if you cast a Doom Blast, which has Abzan in those colors, you can choose either green, black, or white. You cannot choose all three. And your commander also can't be counted towards the total colors that you cast. You then get one point if you create five tokens over the course of the game, creature or non-creature. We found that each of our decks that we created had some type of token sub-theme, so we decided that that would be a good one-point challenge that all of us could potentially hit. Now let's go over the uh, decks. Griffin is playing Zixara the Exemplary. And his personal challenge is create a run of five with X costed spells during the game, such as X equals three, four, five, six, or seven, or any run of five. His opening hand contains Unbound Flourishing, Mind Spring, Counterspell, Protein Hydra, Lanwar Wastes, Island, and Swamp. That's a really good hand. <laughs> yeah, it's an X spell, a counterspell. Uh, yeah, two X spells, actually. Not bad. We then have Peter playing Zyrus, the Writhing Storm, and his personal challenge is make one opponent draw 10 or more cards in a single turn. His opening hand contains a Flood of Tears, Sky Shroud Claim, Heartwood Storyteller, Thassa's Oracle, Command Tower, Mountain, and Forest. We then have Landon piloting Tyam, Luminous Enigma, and his personal challenge is to reanimate a creature, an enchantment, a land, and an artifact throughout the game. His opening hand contains a Savine's Reclamation, Elvish Harbinger, Wirewood Herald, Deathrite Shaman, Arbor Elf, Blooming Marsh, and a Forest. We then have Caleb piloting Jarena Kudro, and his personal challenge is to have creatures pumped up with at least 5 power at any point in the game, such that if a 1-1 token was created, it would be pumped to be at least a 6 power. His opening hand contains Irelis God of Victory, Door of Destinies, Arcane Signet, Plateau, Rugged Prairie, Myriad Landscape, and Plains. I'd like to point out that Caleb's hand is worth more than all of the other hands put together. Because of Plateau. Because of Plateau. <laughs> All right, with the deck introductions out of the way and the challenges explained, let's jump right into the gameplay. Griffin wins the die roll and starts us off. He draws and plays down a Sunken Hollow in his main phase as his land for turn, and with nothing else, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter draws, plays down an island, and with nothing else, passes the turn to Landon. Landon draws, plays down a forest, taps the forest to play Arbor Elf, and with nothing else, passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb draws, plays down Myriad Landscaped Tapped as his land for turn, and passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin draws, and plays down Lanwar Wastes as his land for turn. Griffin, with nothing else, passes the turn to Peter. Peter draws for turn, and plays Command Tower as his land for turn, and taps both of his lands for blue to play Thassa's Oracle. X equaling 2, he looks at the top two cards of his library, puts one on top and the other on bottom, and passes the turn back to Landon. 
Landon untaps and draws and plays Blooming Marsh as his land for turn. He then taps that Blooming Marsh to cast Avacyn's Pilgrim and taps his forest to cast Deathrite Shaman. That is the best ramp. It's pretty dorky. <laughs> that is very dorky. That's that very dorky. Turn. Very, what a dorky turn. And with nothing else, passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb goes to his turn, untaps and draws, and plays down Plateau as his land for turn, and taps both of his lands to cast Arcane Signet. And with nothing else, he passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin draws and plays down an island as his land for turn. He then taps all of his lands to cast Unbound Flourishing. Magic is really hard, guys. It's also very glaring on the screen, but it is an Unbound Flourishing. And with nothing else, passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws, plays down a forest as his land for turn, and taps three for Heartwood Storyteller. Let's go ahead and move to Peter for our first spotlight card of the day, Heartwood Storyteller. Peter here, reporting from the battlefield. Heartwood Storyteller is a creature that reads whenever a player casts a non-creature spell, each of that player's opponents may draw a card. The game plan here in the Zyrus deck is to force each opponent to draw a whole bunch of cards, we'll talk about that later, making a whole bunch of snakes when Zyrus is out on the battlefield, putting the pressure on Peter's opponents to make the right call on when to draw cards and when to hold off to stop his board from developing further. Looks like he doesn't have a Zyrus out yet, but when that does enter the battlefield, things could get a little bit hairy for his opponents. Back to you guys. Definitely watch out for Heartwood Storyteller over the course of this game, it makes a big difference. He then goes to combat and swings Thassa's Oracle at Caleb for a whopping one point of damage. Caleb with no blockers takes it, and with nothing else, Peter passes his turn back to Landon. Assert your dominance. Always. Landon untaps and draws, plays down Jungle Hollow, tapped as his land for turn, gaining a life, going up to 41, and taps out to cast his commander, Tyam. He then gains his three points. Let's move to our first commander spotlight for Tyam Illuminous Enigma. Peter here, reporting from Landon's command zone where Tyam just left to enter the game. Tyam is an Abzan commander that has some pretty powerful effects. First off, whenever another creature enters the battlefield under Landon's control, they will enter with an additional vigilance counter, an enabling ability for his activated ability, which reads, you can pay three mana and remove three counters from among permanents you control, to then put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. Choose a non-land permanent in your graveyard with converted mana cost three or less, and return that to the battlefield under your control. Landon has structured his deck so the majority of the cards in his deck have CMC 3 or less, so he has a lot of options for reanimating creatures. The main goal of the Tyam deck is to activate Tyam enough times to find his win cons and finish out the game. Like we said in the beginning, we have a deck tech on each of these commanders, so please go check out the Tyam deck tech if you're interested in learning more about the strategy of this deck. Peter, out. Feeling pretty confident, he passes his turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays down Rugged Prairie as his land for turn. He then pays 4 mana to cast Door of Destinies, which will then trigger the Heartwood Storyteller, giving Landon, Peter, and Griffin a draw. Let's go ahead and move to our third spotlight card of the day, Door of Destinies. After that, let's go ahead and move to the table to hear some commentary. Peter here, and there's a card I've been really itching to talk about that just entered the battlefield. Door of Destinies is a powerful artifact that lets you choose a creature type, and then whenever you cast a creature of the chosen type, you add a charge counter to Door of Destinies. And then, creatures you control of the chosen type get plus one, plus one for each charge counter on Door of Destinies. Caleb's deck, which we'll discuss a little bit later, has the potential to be casting a ton of humans. So with every human he casts, that Door of Destinies is going to get bigger, and and make his entire board more of a threat. This is Peter. Let's go back to our commentators. Uh, that's everything for me, so I'll pass. What What do you name? Oh, obviously, dragons. All right. Okay, you it. said it. Let's go. <laughs> I'm naming humans. Caleb then passes his turn back over to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a forest as his land for turn. He then taps out to cast his commander, Zaxara the Exemplary. He then gets three points for casting his commander. Let's get a, another card spotlight with Zaxar the Exemplary just to kind of see what Griffin's going to be trying to do this game. Peter here just witnessed an absolute unit of a commander enter the battlefield. Zaxara is a Sultai commander that taps for two of any one color and has an ability that reads whenever you cast a spell with X in its mana cost, create a 0, zero green hydra creature token, then put X plus one plus one counters on it. 
Obviously, he's wanting to play a lot of X spells, but you can see that if the players don't find a way to deal with this quickly, he has the potential to sink at least seven mana into an X spell and double the value of X with his Unbound Flourishing, potentially getting two 14-14 Hydras onto the battlefield next turn. We'll be watching to see how this plays out. Griffin released his XR deck tech last month for this build. Go ahead and follow the links in the description to check it out. Peter out. He then passes the turn back over to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down a mountain as his land for turn. He then taps out to cast Sky Shroud Claim, finding and putting to play Breeding Pool and Ketria Triome. Breeding Pool enters untapped. Peter loses two life, going down to 38, and with nothing else, passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down Sun Petal Grove untapped as his land for turn. He then taps it to main phase swords to plowshares targeting Zaxara, triggering the Heartwood Storyteller. All but Landon draw and Zaxara returns to the command zone, gaining Griffin to life, bringing him up to 42. For those of you who might be watching Duels of the Peaks for the first time, this may seem like a bully play. I want to assert myself as Griffin, the one who this is being targeted against, that I am currently holding the lead with the points by a wide margin. This will represent itself throughout the game, and that is totally okay. That is the point of the series. It's kind of like pseudo arch enemy, <laughs> and we all kind of team up on Griffin for a bit. <laughs> Landon then taps two mana to cast Wirewood Herald, entering with the Vigilance counter due to Tyen's ability. He then taps three mana for Elvish Harbinger, which when enters the battlefield gets a Vigilance counter, and Landon gets to search his library for a Reclamation Sage and put it on top of his library. With nothing else, he passes the turn back over to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws. He then plays God the Shrine tapped, not paying the life, and then taps the rest of his mana to cast his commander, Jarena Kudro, triggering the Door of Destinies and puts a charge counter on it, and bringing his total anthem buffs up to 3 power. And when Jarena enters the battlefield, he's going to make a 1 1 human soldier due to her ability. Peter here, and the commanders seem to be taking the field by storm, although I just saw a pretty beat up Zaxar return to his command zone after being forcibly retired from the field. With the new rules set in place to penalize players for um, casting their commander a second time, Zaxara may not see the field again today. But on to more pressing news. Jarena has entered the battlefield with her ever-growing army of humans. Jarena is a Mardu commander that pumps up every other human on her battlefield by plus two, plus zero, and enters the battlefield making a number of human soldier tokens equal to the number of times she's been cast from the command zone. Like we said before, Caleb has the potential to make a ton of humans in this deck, and they're all getting the benefit from having Jarena on the battlefield. So it looks like the strategy he's going for right now is to get as many human pop effects as he can onto the battlefield so that he reaches his personal challenge as fast as possible. Reporting from the battlefield, this has been your card spotlight. Back to you guys. You know, when we created these uh, with these challenges, we uh, didn't think that uh, Jarena would get there that quick, but apparently a door of destinies will skyrocket you there. With nothing else, he passes the turn back over to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down an island as his land for turn. He then taps three mana for a Protean Hydra, X being doubled due to the unbound flourishing, so the total number of counters that the Protean Hydra will enter with is four. He then moves to his end step, discarding Demir Guildgate, and passes the turn over to Peter. Peter untaps and draws, and taps an island in a forest to cast Growth Spiral, triggering the Heartwood Storyteller, causing everybody else to draw a card. Peter draws a card off of the Growth Spiral, and fails to put a land into play for the second clause of Growth Spiral. He then taps out to cast his commander, Zyrus the Writhing Storm. He then gets three points for casting his commander for the first time. Let's go ahead and go to a quick spotlight card for Zyrus the Writhing Storm. Peter here watching the last of the commanders enter the battlefield. Zyrus is a teamer commander donning two powerful abilities that say whenever an opponent draws a card except for the first one they draw in each of their draw steps, create a 1-1 green snake creature token. And whenever Zyrus deals combat damage to a player, you and that player each draw that many cards. The goal of the Zyrus deck is to take advantage of its opponent's card advantage to get snakes and then either overrun everyone with a bunch of snakes or ping them away with some other enchantment effects. We'll have to see which strategy is being played out here. Really, either one could happen. Once again, we have a deck tech on this commander, so please check out the link below. Peter, out. With nothing else, Peter passes his turn back over to Landon. 
Landon untaps and draws. He then pays two mana to cast Wall of Roots, entering the battlefield with a Vigilance counter. He then activates the Wall of Roots, putting a minus zero minus one counter on it to add one green mana to his mana pool. He then taps two more mana to cast the Reclamation Stage that he tutored for last turn, and when enters the battlefield, he targets the Unbound Flourishing. Griffin responds by tapping two blue mana for a counter spell, triggering the Heartwood Storyteller, giving everybody else a draw except for Griffin. Peter makes two snakes from Zyrus, seeing two people drawing cards, and Reclamation Sage is countered and goes to the graveyard. Landon then taps his Deathrite Shaman to exile the Gilgate from Griffin's graveyard to add a green mana to his mana pool. He then taps two more mana to activate Tyam, removing three counters from among creatures he controls, milling three cards, and then returning Reclamation Sage to the battlefield. When it enters the battlefield, he targets Unbound Flourishing again. This time with no response, Unbound Flourishing is destroyed, and Reclamation Sage enters with a Vigilance counter. Even if I had a Force of Will, I would not have been able to do anything about that because he's not casting the Reclamation Sage. Landon is putting it directly onto the battlefield, which is a an amazing play, Landon. Congratulations. And with nothing else, he passes the turn back over to Caleb. Caleb goes to untap and draws and plays Temple of the False God as his land for turn, which ramps him into six mana that he needed for Aurelia the War Leader. You will hear groans throughout the table, not just because Aurelia is an amazing card, but because the past three times that we've played against Caleb with his Durina deck, he has gotten Aurelia every single time. And has won the game with it. <laughs> he then goes to combat, his first combat step, swinging everything at Griffin. Griffin blocks Jarena, who will trade, and Griffin will take 7 points of damage, bringing him down to 35. Going to his second combat phase due to Aurelia's ability, he swings everything again at Griffin, who takes 5 damage, going down to 30. Caleb then goes to his end step, discarding Ambition's cost to his hand size, and with nothing else, passes the turn over to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws, and plays down a Swamp as his land for turn, and taps 6 mana for Altered Ego, targeting the Zyrus. So Altered Ego will enter as a copy of Zyrus the Riding Storm, but with an additional 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters. This was really important for Griffin at this point in the game because he had just lost his Pydra. All the removal spells have been targeted to him at this point. He wants to make sure that he can stay alive long enough for him to find some way of crawling back into the game. So copying Zyrus was the best thing that could have happened because that means every time Peter wants everybody else to draw cards, Griffin will also make snake tokens, which are potential blockers for Caleb's massive onslaught. Griffin then passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws, and pays 2 mana to cast Impact Tremors, triggering the Heartwood Storyteller, all but Peter draws, Peter gets 3 snakes, and Griffin gets 2 snakes. Let's go ahead and move to a card spotlight on Impact Tremors. Peter here reporting on a card that is making a huge impact on the game here at Duel of the Peaks. Impact Tremors is an enchantment that reads whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, Impact Tremors deals 1 damage to each opponent. This is the kind of win con that Peter needed to start chipping away at his opponents for taking advantage of all the extra draw that he's been getting from Heartwood Storyteller. He'll continue to make snakes and they'll trigger Impact Tremors slowly bringing everybody's life totals down. All he needs is something that will draw everyone a ton of cards and it could be the end of the game. Back to you guys. At this point, Peter gets his 1 point for creating 5 tokens. He then plays Myriad Landscaped Tapped as his land for turn, and then taps 5 mana for Eldrazi Monument. In response to cast, Landon puts a minus 0 minus 1 counter on Wall of Roots. Landon then casts Noxious Revival, targeting the Swords to Plowshares in his graveyard, triggering the Heartwood Storyteller again, making Peter and Griffin draw, both making a snake and impact tremors triggering, dealing 1 damage to each opponent. Landon targets the Swords to Plowshares in his graveyard with the Nauseous Revival and puts it on the top of his library. And then Heartwood Storyteller will trigger from the Eldrazi Monument. All but Peter draw, Peter makes 3 snakes, Griffin makes 2 snakes, and Griffin at this point has now made 5 tokens and gets a point. Impact Tremors triggers again, everyone takes 3 more points of damage, and with nothing else, Peter passes his turn. Landon responds to the end step and casts the Swords to Plowshares, targeting Zyrus. The Heartwood Storyteller triggers again, Peter and Griffin both make 2 snakes each, and Impact Tremors triggers again, dealing 2 damage to each of the opponents. Peter puts Zyrus in the command zone, and then Peter will gain 3 life from the Swords to Plowshares. And with no further game actions, Peter passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, and activates the Wall of Roots, and taps 2 lands to activate Tyam. He removes 3 counters from among creatures he controls, mills 3, and then returns Eternal Witness to the battlefield from his graveyard. It enters with a Vigilance counter, and he returns Ritual of Soot to his hand. Landon at this point is asking everybody on the table to get rid of his Reclamation Sage so that he can bring it back to get rid of that Eldrazi Monument, because that is a major threat at this point because of all of Peter's snakes that he's making. They are all buffed, flying, and indestructible. Oh, man. Can somebody kill my Reclamation Sage? 
Sure, buddy. You can? Uh, swing at me and I'll... Not right now. I'll okay. Block it. Yeah, I will... Um, I'll block it. Yeah, you will block it, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> What's the sarcasm I, I don't know. I I'll some, block sometimes it. I just... I do that. It's okay. Um, Landon then goes to combat, swinging the Reclamation Sage at Caleb. Caleb blocks with the Aurelia. Per their deal, Reclamation Sage dies, and then Landon taps three mana for Abs and Ascendancy, which is going to trigger the Heartwood Storyteller again. All but Landon draw. Griffin makes two snakes. And then Landon resolves the Abzan Ascendancy, putting a plus one plus one counter on each of his creatures. He then taps three creatures to activate Tyam, removing three counters from among creatures he controls, mills three, and returns Reclamation Sage to the battlefield, targeting the Eldrazi Monument, which is destroyed. With nothing else, he passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws, and plays down Isolated Chapel as his land for turn. He then pays four mana to cast Smothering Tithe, triggering the Heartwood Storyteller, all but Caleb draw. Griffin makes two snakes. All right, Peter, take us away. Peter here, and that Smothering Tithe has to be one of the best cards ever printed in white, and a truly beautiful sight to see here on the battlefield today. Smothering Tithe reads, whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two. If that player doesn't, you create a treasure token, and that treasure can be sacrificed for one mana of any color. This ramp piece almost couldn't have gotten any better for Caleb. It's early game, so people may not be willing to pay that cost in the interest of saving their mana for their own spells. And the Zyrus deck is making everybody draw a ton of cards, so everyone seems to be reaping the extra benefits off of the Zyrus build, maybe more than Peter was anticipating. One mass draw effect, and Caleb could be getting an insane amount of mana that might be enough to overwhelm his opponents. Let's see what happens, but for now, Peter out. Caleb then pays two mana to cast Rakdos Signet, triggering the Heartwood Storyteller. All but Caleb draws. Griffin makes two more snakes, and no one pays for the Smothering Tribe trigger, giving Caleb three treasures. Having a Heartwood Storyteller out from Peter's side of the board and having a Smothering Tithe out on Caleb's side of the board just gave Caleb a massive advantage. Everybody's going to be drawing cards consistently, and I guarantee nobody's going to be able to pay for it because that's so many cards, which means Caleb has just mana ramped like crazy. In hindsight, we probably shouldn't have been drawing so much off of that Heartwood Storyteller. <laughs> it's just so hard to resist. It's hard. Caleb then pays three mana for Archetype of Courage, which triggers the Door of Destinies, and it gets another charge counter, buffing up his team again. He then sacrifices two treasures to cast Thalia's Lieutenant, triggering the Door of Destinies again, getting another charge counter, and it is now at three. Thalia's Lieutenant puts a plus one plus one counter on all of the other humans when it enters the battlefield, and Caleb then moves to his first combat step, swinging the Aurelia at Peter for three. Peter can't block and takes it, going down to 38. In the second combat step, Caleb then swings the Aurelia at Peter again for another three damage, which Peter still can't block and goes down to 35. With nothing else, Caleb passes the turn back over to Griffin. Griffin goes to his turn, untaps and draws, not paying for the smothering tithe. Caleb gets another treasure. He then plays down a forest as his land for turn and taps four mana for Leyline of Anticipation, triggering the Heartwood Storyteller, making all but Griffin draw. Griffin makes three snakes. Caleb makes two treasures and Landon responds to the trigger by activating Wall of Roots, doing nothing with the mana. At this point, let's go ahead and go to a table commentary, which is going to be very important for why Griffin decides not to attack with his snakes. My my reasoning is, so say I like swing everything at Caleb, and then Peter is like, oh, well, he, he's tapped, he swung out, so I'll swing everything at him. And then you are like, well, that sounds nice, and I won't cast the ritual of set. <laughs> I get totally beaten down by Caleb. <laughs> That is the exact kind of thing that's going through my head. Uh, Griffin then moves to his end step, discarding five cards, and then passes the turn back over to Peter. Peter untaps and draws. Caleb gets a treasure for Peter not paying the Smothering Tithe trigger. He then pays six mana to cast the Locust God. Peter. 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 The Locust God. The Locust God. What, what does he do? Peter, tell him. Peter here, after receiving some strange noises from our commentators, I'm assuming it's time to talk about the Locust God. He's got a lot of text on him, but the most important thing to note is that this blue-red legendary creature will make Peter a 1-1 insect token with flying every time he draws a card. With Zyrus not on the battlefield, Peter needed some sort of token generator to continue getting value out of that impact tremors, otherwise he's just sitting there letting everybody else draw cards with no extra benefit. Very smart play from Peter, and the Locust God is one of those creatures that's really hard to get rid of once he gets going, so this is exactly what Peter needed. Back to you guys. 
Peter has now hit his two point challenge for casting two spells of each of his colors. He then plays Mosswort Bridge as his land for turn and with the hideaway trigger puts a card underneath it and the rest on the bottom of his library. He then pays the rest of his mana to cast Altar of Dementia, triggering the Heartwood Storyteller. Everybody else takes the draw, making Griffin two more snakes and Caleb gets two more treasures. Caleb has now made his fifth token and gets a point. Landon activates the Wall of Roots again to add a counter to it but does nothing with the mana. Peter then moves to his end step, discarding a Perforos and Crater Hoof Behemoth, which makes everybody at the table a little nervous. Landon responds by exiling the Crater Hoof Behemoth with the Deathrite Shaman, gaining Landon to life. This is a comment that I make in many games of Magic, but I always say, the only thing scarier than a good card in somebody's hand is a good card in somebody's graveyard. So having Crater Hoof Behemoth go into the graveyard was extremely scary and in my head, and I don't know what everybody else is thinking, but in my head I'm like, next turn he's gonna bring that out. So having Landon respond to Exile it gave us all a little bit of, of room to breathe. Yeah, I don't think like he really had any ways of reanimating it. I just think that he thought he didn't really need it, which if it's he- Also very scary. Yeah, if he would have casted it that turn, which I think he could have, he probably would have just won the game, but who, who really knows what could have happened, but that's what he did, and I was very happy to exile it, so. Landon goes to his turn, untaps and draws, giving Caleb a treasure. He then plays a snow-covered plains as his land for turn. He activates Deathrite Shaman to exile land from Griffin's graveyard to add a black mana to his mana pool, and taps three more to cast a Ritual of Soot. This will trigger the Heartwood Storyteller again, all but Landon will draw, Caleb gets two treasures, Griffin gets two snakes, and Peter makes an insect, triggering the impact tremors, dealing one damage to all of his opponents. Caleb responds to the board wipe with a flawless maneuver for three mana, giving all of his creatures indestructible until end of turn, saving them from the board wipe. This will trigger the Heartwood Storyteller again. All but Caleb draw, Caleb gets three more treasures, Griffin gets two snakes, Peter gets an insect, triggering the impact tremors again, dealing one more damage to each of his opponents. Landon responds to Flawless Maneuver by activating Tyam, removing three counters from among permanent he controls, milling three. He then returns the Grim Har Respects to his battlefield. Peter responds to the Ritual of Soot by sacrificing his 15 creatures, all but Locust God, to Altar of Dementia, milling Griffin for 16 cards. Finally, Ritual of Soot resolves, affecting nothing on Caleb's or Peter's board, killing all of Griffin's creatures except for the Altered Ego Zyrus, and Landon's board dies except for Tyam. Three triggers then go on the stack for things dying. He resolves the Wild Wood Herald first, finding and putting a Safehold Elite on top of his library, and with all the other creatures dying, gets nine spirits off of Abzan Ascendancy. All enter with Vigilance counters from Tyam, and Landon gets a point for making his five tokens. The Grim Harrispex triggers, drawing Landon eight cards, paying for none of the Smothering Tithe triggers, giving Caleb eight treasures, and Griffin gets eight snakes from his copy of Zyrus. Landon then pays one more mana to cast Spore Frog, which will enter with a Vigilance counter, and passes his turn, discarding seven cards. Caleb goes to his turn, untaps and draws, and plays Command Tower as his land for turn. He then taps five mana to cast Angel of Invention, fabricating two, putting two plus one plus one counters on it, and then taps three mana for Thraben Doomsayer, which will trigger the Door of Destinies, adding another charge counter to it. That's, this will also trigger Thalia's Lieutenant, putting a plus one plus one counter on it. By now, he has definitely met his personal challenge of pumping six. At this point, I'm not worried about the points, I'm worried about all the damage that's gonna come smack me in the face. And surviving. He then uses three treasures to cast Mentor of the Meek, triggering the Door of Destinies, putting another charge counter on it, and then triggers Thalia's Lieutenant, getting another plus one, plus one counter on it. He then uses four treasures to cast Iroas, God of Victory. He then taps his command tower and five treasures to cast Jarena for the second time, losing his three points for having cast his commander a second time. So I just wanted to know about Iroas. This was actually a big part of the game. The reason why is because I knew that this this a combat that Caleb was about to go to was gonna come at me. I, I, I felt it and I'm very easy to be killed, but my one defense was that I, I did have a lot of snakes. So at this point in the game, I wanted to let you guys know what my plan was. In my hand, I had a finale of devastation. I also had some mana ramp that I was gonna cast on my end step to be able to get to 12 mana. I was gonna use the finale of devastation to search for a crater hoof behemoth, pump all of my snake tokens plus 15 plus 15 with trample and try to win that way. However, when the Iroas dropped, at this point I knew I was dead. The snakes now have to, because Iroas gives all of 
Caleb's creatures menace. That means now I have to double block and lose double the tokens, which means I wouldn't have much, if at all, any snake tokens left to be able to retaliate. This will trigger the Door of Destinies, putting a charge counter on it. Drano will make two more human soldier tokens, which will trigger the Thalu's Lieutenant three times, putting three more plus one plus one counters on it. And Caleb moves to his combat step. He then swings everything he possibly can at Griffin. Griffin blocks three of the things that he can with six of his snakes. He then goes down to two snakes left, takes four damage total, going down to 18 life. Aurelia then untaps all of his things. Going to his second combat step, he then swings the rest of everything at Griffin. Griffin then flashes in the Geyer Sage, double blocks the two biggest threats, taking the rest of the damage, and goes down to three measly life. Oh, Caleb then passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws. Caleb gets a treasure for Griffin not paying the Smothering Tithe trigger. Griffin plays the Yavimaya Coast as his land for turn and passes, suspiciously holding up all of his mana. Peter I have a lee line of anticipation. That's not that suspicious. It's suspicious. <laughs> Peter goes to his turn, untaps and draws. Caleb gets another treasure. Peter gets an insect from drawing, triggering the impact tremor, dealing one damage to each of his opponents. Peter then plays down his reliquary tower as his land for turn. And at this point, Griffin tries to make a deal with Peter. Let's go ahead and move to that now. Would you let me draw some cards? That's all I, I That's all I want. I just want to draw some cards. I would just love to draw some cards. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, do it. I'm going to make you draw some cards. Yes! And it's going to kill you. <laughs> okay! <laughs> Peter then taps one blue mana to cast Minds Aglow. There is some interesting dialogue at the table with this Minds Aglow. I wanted to preface this, you guys. The reason why I wanted Peter to let me draw some cards is because I was only two black spells away from attaining those points. However, in my deck, I have only two black cards. I had taken out all tutors for this game, which left me with two black cards. My only hope to get those points was to get both of those cards in these next five. No, I'm not paying. Okay, well, I start. Okay, okay. Yes. so I will pay four. Okay. I will pay this much. <laughs> yeah, okay. Zip. Okay, you're about to die. <laughs> Think wisely. Do I draw the cards? You draw the cards. I also draw cards. I'm going to make the trigger insects, will go the stack. impact tremors. Hmm. Four triggers. No, I will not pay anything. Okay. So we will draw four cards. Okay, everyone will draw four cards. Is anyone paying for any of that? Peter pays an additional four mana into the Minds of Glow, and nobody else pays any mana into the Minds of Glow. So everyone draws four cards. Caleb makes 12 treasures. There are four triggers on the Locust God, who is about to make four insect tokens, which when they come into play will kill Griffin. <laughs> Whatever he's about to do, we should stop him. No, him Don't go. count me. <laughs> I just want points. Griffin, responding to the first of the Locust God triggers, casts Torment of Hellfire for two mana, x equal to zero, doing absolutely nothing. The only two. <laughs> for nothing. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why? Why? And then Griffin casts Corpse Jack, which are the only two black spells in his deck. The reason why I was dying of laughter was because in the four cards that I drew off of Minds Aglow, I drew the only two black cards in my entire deck with the mana to cast them. This was the luckiest point in magic that I have ever had. Griffin gets his two points for casting two spells of each of his commander's colors. With those resolved and out of the way, the Locust God trigger resolves, making four insect tokens, and when they come into play, the impact tremors will the impact tremors will trigger, dealing four damage to each of Peter's opponents. Griffin now dies, Landon goes down to 30, and Caleb is now at 26. Rip, Rip in peace, peace Griffin. Griffin. Well, that's uh, that's gonna be it for Griffin. Um, like I said before, it may seem like the whole table was targeting Griffin, and that's because they were. If you look at the points, Griffin is... Poor Griffin. Griffin is very far ahead. <laughs> so uh, there is no there is no salt. There is no shame. There is, this is simply the name of Duel of the Peaks. I, I did what I wanted to do, get as many points, because I knew I was going to be ahead and targeted. It is totally fine. But you know what? I did it. I was yeah. able to cast the two spells of each color. And for that, I won this game. I won this game, Landon. Yeah. Moving on. You won this game. 
Peter then pays four mana to cast Xenagos the Reveler. He then ticks up Xenagos, adding six mana to his mana pool, and uses four of it to cast Teferi's Puzzle Box. He then uses the other three remaining mana to cast Commander's Fear. He then goes to his end step and lend in response to the end step by paying three mana and activating Tyam. He removes three counters from among creatures he controls, mills three, and returns Devoted Druid, which will enter with a Vigilance counter. Landon goes to his turn and untaps, and responds to his upkeep by casting Croson Grip, destroying the puzzle box, which is going to put his hand on the bottom of his library and he did not want that. He then draws and Caleb gets a treasure. He plays a Swamp as his land for turn and activates Tyam, removing three counters from among creatures and mills three cards and returns Eternal Witness. When it enters the battlefield, he will target the Blossoming Defense. Caleb responds to this, seeing the inevitable doom with the Blossoming Defense and Devoted Druid combo, and casts Swords to Plowshares targeting the Devoted Druid. Landon responds by tapping the Devoted Druid for a green mana and untapping it using the ability to put a minus one minus one counter on it, and then does it two more times to kill the Devoted Druid to put it back into his graveyard to save it from being exiled. He then has two green mana floating and returns the Blossoming Defense to his hand. Abs and Ascendancy will trigger seeing the Devoted Druid dying and will create a spirit which will enter with a Vigilance counter. And let's do also a quick combo spotlight on the Devoted Druid Blossoming Defense. Let's go Peter! Peter here to explain the combo that Landon just assembled. Devoted Druid taps for a green mana, but you can also untap it by putting a minus one minus one counter on it. Normally Devoted Druid will die after the second minus one minus one counter is put on it. But if you can find a way to pump it up by at least two toughness, you can put up to three minus one minus one counters on it without it dying, generating you three mana. That's exactly what Blossoming Defense does, along with giving it an additional hexproof layer to make sure Landon's opponents don't interact with it. If Blossoming Defense resolves, Devoted Druid can make three mana, and then Tyam can use that mana to remove the three minus one minus one counters on the Druid to activate his ability. Thus, Landon can mill his entire library from continuing to activate Devoted Druid and Tyam, and get something onto the battlefield that will win him the game. We'll see if he's going to be able to assemble this combo. Peter out. He then uses his two floating mana to cast Safehold Delete, which will enter with the Vigilance counter, and this will give Landon his two points for casting two spells of each of his colors. With nothing else, he passes his turn, discarding three cards. At the end step, Caleb responds by sacrificing the Myriad Landscape to find some basic lands. Caleb goes to his turn and untaps and draws, and pays three mana to cast Herald's Horn. He then pays two mana to cast Verge Rangers, which will trigger the Door of Destinies and getting another charge counter. This will trigger Thalia's Lieutenant again, getting a plus one plus one counter, and Caleb will play down Castle Ardenville as his land for turn. He then taps two mana to cast Frontline Medic, triggering the Door of Destinies and the Thal Thalia's Lieutenant again, who is now at a swole eight power. Caleb uses the Verge Ranger's ability to look at the top card of his library, because he can, and then moves to combat, swinging everything at Landon. Landon responds to declared attacks by sacrificing the Spore Frog to prevent all combat damage for the rest of the turn. This is super relevant because the Aurelia giving him a second combat st step is also nerfed. The Abs and Ascendancy will trigger seeing the Frog die and Landon will get a Spirit with a Vigilance counter. Caleb untaps. Caleb still goes to a second combat step just to untap but doesn't attack and with nothing else passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws, giving Caleb another treasure, and giving Peter another insect, triggering the impact tremors, dealing 1 damage to the remaining opponents. He then activates Xenagos, adding 7 mana to his mana pool. He then uses 1 green to activate the Mosswort Bridge's ability to cast the Hidden Away card, which was Goblin Bombardment. <gasps> Goblin Bombardment. Alright, Peter, calling out to you, buddy. Peter here for what will probably be our final card spotlight of the match because that goblin bombardment is a super vital piece for Peter to have hidden away on turn 7. Goblin bombardment allows you to sacrifice a creature to deal 1 damage to target creature or player. At this point in the game, if Peter has enough creatures and his opponent's life totals are low enough, he can sacrifice all those tokens to goblin bombardment to deal the final blows to them. It looks like he can't just win right away, his opponents have too high of a life total for him and he doesn't have enough tokens. So let's see how this plays out and if he's going to be able to pull it off. This is Peter signing off for the last time from the Duel of the Peaks battlefield. Back to you guys. He then taps eight mana and uses the rest to cast Blue Sun Zenith X equal to 11, targeting himself to draw 11 cards. 
This resolves, Blue Sun Zenith is shuffled away, Caleb makes 11 treasures, Peter makes 11 insects, triggering impact tremors 11 times, bringing Landon down to 18 and Caleb down to 14. I just wanted to say at this point in the game, this is only halfway through this turn. There have been so many triggers and so many things to follow that your eyes have probably been burned out from trying to follow it. So we apologize in advance for, <laughs> for making you watch this exact disaster that is Commander. Let's go ahead and move to a table cutaway of me in my natural environment. Eating ice cream. Strawberry ice cream. It's pretty good. It's really good. All right. Peter then goes to combat, swinging 17 insects at Caleb. Caleb responds by sacrificing four treasures to activate Castle Ardenville, making a human token. Triggering the Door of Destiny and Thalo's Lieutenant, he then taps Thraben Doomsayer to make another token. Triggering Door of Destiny's and Thalo's Lieutenant again, Caleb declares Aurelia and Angel of Invention as blockers. Peter responds to declared blockers by sacrificing the two that were blocked to Goblin Bombardment, dealing two damage to Landon, and Caleb takes the other 15 and goes to zero, and Landon is now down to 16. Peter sacrifices the rest of his tokens and his Locust God to deal the remaining 16 damage necessary to finish off Landon, giving Peter the dub. Yay, Peter! All right, congratulations to Peter for very elegantly securing that game. He did really well the whole game and was never really behind. He always had a bunch of things on his side of the board and with that goblin bombardment had what he needed to win the game. I had to say this game was one of the one of the best games of Duels of the Peak because Caleb, Landon, and Peter all had opportunities to win multiple times and it was it was bouncing off of each other who was going to respond to who with what triggers on the stack and who was going to deal with this and all that kind of jumbled together until finally somebody was able to pull out and that person was Peter. I do think that Peter definitely deserved that win but Caleb and Landon were just so close to that that it really could have been anybody's game at this point. This really goes to show how much more powerful the decks are that we build compared to the pre-cons. <laughs> Just the amount of triggers that have to go on the stack. If we represented the stack in, in coins, during that last turn, the coins would be like a foot high. A lot of coins. So, Lana, now that the game is finished, what do you think was the play of the game or the, the turn of the game? Honestly, I think one of the turn of the games was either when that Goblin Bombardment was cast off of the Mosswort Bridge. I, I, I'm gonna have to say the Goblin Bombardment was probably one of the turning points of the game. That kind of gave Peter like what he needed to close out the game. I think the Ritual of Soot was a big play. And also that play where Caleb swords your- Devoted Druid. Yeah, swords your Devoted Druid in response to be able to get rid of it. And with that Devoted Druid, you would have won that turn? I, I would have won that turn. I would yeah. say that that was the most important play because that allowed Peter to win yeah, I had everything that I needed to combo off with that Devoted Druid. I had the Blossom Defense in my graveyard. I had enough counters on my creatures to activate Tyam. Um, I was even able to reanimate the Devoted Druid on Peter's end step so that I could activate it the turn on my turn, which was one of the things I was worried about the whole game was uh, casting the Devoted Druid and hoping that it survived the whole turn cycle. So ideally, I was actually trying to put the Devoted Druid into my graveyard, but ultimately it got swords, so... Way to go, Caleb. What we do know is that in games like this, it's really hard to say what the play of the game was because there are so many turning points consistently all the time. And that is the game of Commander. But probably cards like MVP cards, definitely Heartwood Storyteller and Goblin Bombardment. So. All right. With that, let's go ahead and rack up the points for the game. Winning three points, we have Caleb, who got his one point challenge and his personal challenge, giving him a total of 14 points for the season. Landon getting six points from getting the one, two, and three point challenges up to 14 points for the season. Griffin earning six points by getting the one, two, and three point challenges missing his personal challenge, giving him a total of 30 points for the season. And then Peter coming in first with this game with nine points, winning the game, also attaining his one, two, and three point challenges, putting him at a total of 25 points for the season. So to recap, we have Griffin in the lead with 30 points, Peter second with 25, and then Caleb and Landon tied for third with 14 points. So overall, a really good game for points. Even though Peter was able to take the win, we see that the points really add such a different element to this game because at the end of it, everybody got between six to nine points. 
And, and the only reason Peter got nine was because of that win. Everybody else was able to keep up with those points. That's why we really like this in Duels of the Peak. That's why we think you guys will enjoy it because it really mixes up the game and, and incentivizes you to do things to, to do things that you wouldn't normally do. It opens up a lot of really interesting interactions that you maybe wouldn't have seen before if it weren't for these challenges. So thank you guys so much for watching this gameplay up until this point. We really hope that you enjoyed it. If you have any suggestions on commanders that you'd like to see us play on Duels of the Peaks or ideas to make our content any better, we'd love to hear it down in the comment section below. We appreciate all of your guys' support and just one more quick reminder to hit that subscribe button so you stay up to date on our weekly deck tech videos and and Duels of the Peaks, which will be coming out every month. Thank you guys so much, and until next time. See you guys. Not to get political or anything, but what the heck is oatmeal? <laughs>